Um, obviously, huge, uh, a huge amount of, a huge number of stories coming out of uh, both media on the left and on the right uh, about the response to the raid on Donald Trump. It has, it has raised the temperatures. It has raised anxiety. We saw this guy, you know, supposedly attack the FBI building and, uh, and, and get shot and somebody else try to ram his car into, into the Capitol. You know, we're not even sure they're related, but, but it, it just seems like people are on edge, people are freaking out. And there was a lot of, a lot of talk, a lot of talk of a uh, civil war. I mean, uh, Stephen Crowder, um, af right after the, the FBI search of uh, Trump's Mar-a-Lago Mar Mar property, tomorrow is war, he, he, he announced, I think it was on Twitter. And, and then the next day, you know, he said, today is war. That is all you will get on today's show. And he did a whole show on today is war. Um, and the question, and, and then of course, the New York Times has, has covered just a rise in in the the, uh, the the violent language coming out of the right. In this case, uh, this means war. We're at war. Country on the verge of civil war. All of these are titles and tweets and people, uh, you know, people sounding off on uh, on what is going on in the world. And it seems like the raid, the FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago, has just intensified these emotions intensified these feelings and, and caused everybody kind of uh, significantly to, uh, to get excited about this. Uh, so I, let's talk about it. So first, uh, two stories, uh, two opinion pieces really that uh, I'm going to be drawing on that uh, I think have given me some food for thought on this and I found interesting. One was in the Daily Beast by Bonnie Christian Friday um, and it was published, I don't know, published... Uh, uh, you know, just yesterday or the day before, something like that. And, the, uh, and that's really from kind of a, she's probably on the left perspective, given this a daily beast. And then um, the other one is from the right, uh, uh, John Hawkins. Uh, John Hawkins is like a, a pro-Trump rightist, but one of the more, um, you know, more articulate ones. And, um, and he writes a Substack that I subscribe to, and I get a substacks. And uh, so she wrote, uh, Bonnie wrote, Americans are too pampered and neurotic to fight a civil war. And, uh, and John Hawkins says, are Americans really too pampered and neurotic to fight a, a civil war? So they kind of went, you know, uh, uh, went at each other. And I found, I found the exchange interesting. And uh, that's kind of what inspired uh, my, uh, my, discussion, my discussion today. Uh, let me just see where are we. I want to make sure I'm keeping up with the chat. Let's move that over there. Move this over here and open that. All right. Again, I, I need to travel with a, a, a big screen so I can uh, track everything that's going on. So there's a lot of talk of war. There's a lot of talk of civil war. But, uh, you know, what does uh, what does uh, Crowder mean by war? what's he really talking about? And this comes from, from the piece in the Daily Beast. You know, what does war mean to Crowder? It primarily means, means mean memes. It primarily means uh, lots of Twitter posts. It primarily means yelling and shouting and, po and, and, and pounding on the table. Uh, I think at the, uh, you know, on his, on his war show, um, you know, he said, it's time to fight for every square inch. Uh, he said, fight like hell. And uh, what should you do? Well, you should do is go, you know, what's the action? What's the, what's the call to action when he's talking about, let's go fight a war. This is, this is serious. We're, you know, what's the call to action? The call to action is go to crowdershop.com, use code fight, and you get 15% off of your, I don't know, let's fight the war t-shirts or something like this. So there's a lot of chest beating, but chest beating is primarily something that people like Crowder and others on the right, and we'll talk about the left in a minute, have used in order to rile people up and get people excited and really to get people to watch the show. I mean, it's why there are more people right now watching this show than maybe usual at this time of day 
um, uh, live because the title is Civil War. And how, how can you not? It's, it's, how can you not come and watch a title of Civil War? There's a lot of chest beating. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of the use of the term war to, to, to indicate a, 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 real, a real conflict of ideas, a real conflict of, of ideas, a real conflict of rhetoric, a real, a real uh, you know, trying to get people active and excited. And, and the, the terminology of war often applies to this. Yes, I know some of you watch the show, watch every show they can. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> but at the margin, you got to admit at the margin, my show on, uh, on uh, beautiful romantic art is going to score fewer people than civil war. Are we going to civil war? <laughs> it's just, that's the way it is, right? Um, you know, we've got, we've got a, 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 a lot of people who, are making the case that this is serious, that uh, there is going to be a, a civil war, um, particularly over the last three years, particularly since the last election. There's been a lot of discussion on this on the le on the right. Um, we'll talk again. We'll, we'll get to the left. Don't worry. Um, you, you know the 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 um, the, the, the storming of. Uh, I mean, think about the acts of violence over the last three years. We got. Uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matter burning down uh, city centers, uh, burning down stores, rioting, breaking windows. I mean, you saw the pictures out of Portland. It was it was almost civil war like just in Portland for a few months. Uh, it was it was un, un, you know unbelievable destruction. And and what was interesting in Portland was that most of the uh, focus of the demonstrators was the focus of the destruction was on most of it, not all of it, was on uh, government buildings and federal government buildings. And was, it, it was like a, a, an uprising against the federal government in, a, in, a, in this little uh, locality of Portland. You notice that all of that is gone and kind of uh, dissipated. Uh, you know, you saw the destruction of police department in Minnesota and in other places around the world, the tax of the police department. We saw the January 6th attack on the... Uh, on the um, on, uh, Congress. Um, and, and, you know, again, and so we've seen an increase in violence. You're also seeing, I think, more kind of uh, uh, people taking up, taking guns, usually it's crazy individuals, and going out and using a political manifesto, political agenda, typically from the right, um, and, and just going shooting people, whether it's uh, minorities or whether it's immigrants, whether it's in, you know, we've seen that in a number of different locations after the first after the last few years. So there's no question there is a rise over the last few years of political violence, of violence that is motivated by politics. And that is just part of the world in which we live and part of the reality in which we live right now. And you can see, and many people are warning, that this escalation, that this increase, this escalation and this increase is... aiming towards civil war, ultimately. Right. Is it? Is that where we're heading? Is it possible? Now, again, this is from the Daily Beast. Um, I mean, this is what she writes, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote it. I don't think that most, I, I, I don't, uh, so it's talking about the violence. She says, I don't, I, I don't even, I don't think that this is most people, the violence. I don't think, it's most people who like uh, uh, LARP, extremist po politics on the internet. There is a madness of crowds, yes, and mobs will do things their individual members will not. But there's a yawning gap between rage booking while you watch Fox News or getting hyped about Make America Great Again on Twitter and bludgeoning a real-life human being because he voted the wrong way. It's a gap I don't believe most Americans are prepared to cross. Now, for the most part, I think she's right. But we'll see, for the most part. We are, as a people, I'm reading from her, really out, uh, where there's no air conditioning, in the forest, without refrigerators. Do we hate each other enough to eat hard track, to undergo battle surgeries? Who, who knows about foraging anymore? Can you start a fire with nothing but sticks? And there's no YouTube tutorials. They'd knock down the cell towers during a civil war. 
In the last two years, large swaths of the country declared their lungs too weak to breathe through cotton cloth, while others insisted it was deadly dangerous to take, on open air, to take an open air walk on the beach without the same cloth. Are these people actually going to go to fight? Right? I mean, are we really, are Americans really going to go out into the woods and start killing each other? I mean, put aside the hatred. There's a lot of hatred out there. There really is hatred out there. The hatred is legit. But most Americans who hate, most of the people I see, most of the people even complaining in this chat about the state of the world and how ugly it is and how horrible it is, are... Complainers who sit on the sofa and complain. They sit on Twitter or they sit on whatever the medium of their preference on the Euron Brook show and they bitch and complain. They get riled up and they might join a protest here and there. But do you really understand what a civil war really means? What it means to fight? What life is like? when fighting like a civil war occurs? How many people actually believe enough in their ideas, any ideas, to be willing to go out there and literally start killing people? But not just killing people, but, you know, be shot at, live on the run, have to do all the things that you, as a survivalist, have to do? How many people would know how to do it? Very few. I mean, most Americans, I think even with guns, yeah, they can go out and they can shoot at targets and it's fun and it's exciting and they think that when the time comes, they will use those guns to defend themselves against whom? Is it the American military that is unbelievably equipped and unbelievably trained and can wipe you out in an instant? and has big weapons with incredible accuracy and can hunt you down anywhere using drones and high tech. How many Americans are really willing to do that? Hundreds, thousands? To be a civil war, it would have to be thousands. They'd have to be well-trained and they'd have to be able to survive for a while. And if they're going up against the US military, would they? How many? War has always been a young person's game. Young people go to war. Old people, older people, over 30 year olds, rarely go to war. Too much to lose, life too comfortable. Eh, and physically, maybe not in that good shape. I mean, look at Americans. Look at Americans. They're obese, they're out of shape. I mean, how many how many American young people, how many American young people today qualify, never mind want, but qualify to go into the military? I actually had the numbers here. Let me see if I can find the numbers. <laughs> it's some pathetic number. <laughs> who, who qualify from, from purely physical perspective? Let me find this for you. Yeah. The pool of those eligible to join the military continues to shrink, with more young men and women than ever disqualified for obesity, drug use, or criminal records. Last month, Army General uh, Chief of Staff uh, John uh, McConville testified before Congress that, on that only 23% of Americans 17 to 24 are qualified to serve without a waiver to join, down from 29% just a few years ago. An internal Defense Department survey obtained by NBC News found that only 9% of those young Americans eligible to serve in the military had any inclination to do so, the lowest number since 2007. So the Army is having a problem with recruiting anybody, primarily, or to a large extent, because there are not that many young people who can run and jump and shoot and do all this stuff physically. We are today a country of wimps, of unfit, 
emotionalistic. We're good at yelling. We're good at shouting. We're good at target practice. We're good at taking our guns out to the woods and shooting stuff. But what would we be fighting for? What are we willing to reduce our standard of living and quality of life dramatically for? What are we willing to live in the wilderness and be hunted down for? Very few people, very, very few people would be willing to do that. What about BLM and Antifa? BLM and Antifa? BLM and Antifa wouldn't last five minutes. BLM and Antifa, the only reason, the only reason they got as violent as they did, the only reason they succeeded in the kind of looting and destruction that they succeeded in is because they were treated with kick gloves. It's only because the police didn't go after them. I mean, how long would it actually take to shut down a BLM riot or an Antifa gathering? An Antifa are cowards. If they don't have 15 to 1 odds, they don't fight. 15 to 1 odds in their favor. If it actually got into a real battle, they would run like the cowards that they are. Well, we definitely need stronger law enforcement. There's a question about that. But I'm talking about who in the, among the American people, who among these young punks is actually willing, actually able, actually wants to go out there and actually engage in a fight? My argument is almost nobody is competent. Almost nobody, nobody would do it. They're just... And, and you know, wars... Um, People have to believe in something deeply. And yes, there are people who believe stuff in deeply. Many of the Antifa people believe their stuff deeply. But they're incompetent and useless. Think about the January 6th insurgents. And I think what happened in January 6th is horrific and awful. But think about how incompetent and pathetic where they were. A bunch of yahoos walking into Capitol Hill. No plan, no leadership. Some of them had weapons. They were willing to beat up cops, but now use the weapons. Why? Because they knew what the response would be. Who exactly is going to lead these people? Well, maybe General Flynn, I guess. So there is a real case to be made that the likelihood of a civil war is zero now because we don't hate each other, not because there's no real strife, not because there's real, not real disagreement, but because there's just nobody to fight. Nobody willing to actually pick up arms because the American people are too lazy, pampered, uh, uh, overweight, unfit to actually engage in a war. And this would be a war. And depending on how the civil war would land up, right? There's a good chance you would be fighting against the best trained military in the world. How long would you survive? So that is an argument, I think a fairly strong argument. And, and let me add one more element to this. Other than a few crazies on the Antifa side, BLM, and on the I don't know, prob I, I don't know who represents the, the kind of crazy right, but you know, the kind of shooters of, of, uh, that have gone in and, and, and shot up places. Um, on the right, how many are there on both extremes, on both sides of this? Um, how many are there that are really willing to actually go out and kill people? I mean, there might be, there might be hundreds on each side, but are there thousands? Are there tens of thousands? Are there hundreds of thousands? I mean, a civil war, uh, uh, we have a population of 350 million people. Is it, are there several million on each side that are willing to actually go to battle, actually willing to kill fellow Americans because they disagree politically? Is that something that is the realistic thing, realistically think, 
is going to happen? I mean, I think you can make a case that right now, no. That while there might be some hundreds of people here, hundreds of people there who are willing to go out and kill fellow Americans because they disagree about the outcome of the 2020 election, it's a tiny, 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 tiny minority at this point, as bad as our political culture is. It's still a tiny minority. So is a civil war therefore impossible? Well, no, it's certainly still possible. Things can get bad and they can get bad quickly. While, you know, civil wars don't necessarily involve 100% of the population fighting, uh, the Civil War, for example, the U.S. Civil War, about 10% of Americans fought, fought in. In World War II, about 11%. The number of Americans serving in the military today is less than 1%. But you can imagine a civil war breaking out represented by those people who can take up arms. In particular, those people in the military who not only can take up arms, but are trained and qualified to take up arms. You can imagine a world in which the military is split and where different units within the military are fighting each other. Some representing, quote, one elected government and the other representing an insurgency or representing something else. Hard to tell. But you can imagine the U.S. military splitting and fighting within You could imagine states seceding and the federal government attempting to stop them from seceding and force being used in, in, in those kind of interchanges that could be pretty brutal and pretty big and, and, and pretty significant and where soldiers leave the federal you know, military and join their state militias in order to fight against the federal government. And you, you, know, you could imagine things like that get pretty, pretty ugly. You could also imagine a world in which small groups of people, hundreds, maybe thousands, who are well-equipped, well-trained, create havoc within society, terrorize, kill, destroy, and where civilization crumbles, not because it's millions of people fighting each other, but just because a few very well-trained people create real I mean, imagine if dams are bombed, uh, uh, electricity is taken out. For the same reason, I talked about the fact that Americans are pampered and therefore those Americans will not fight. For the same reason, those kind of Americans, how would they survive if there's fighting around them? It's this fighting that's taking out the infrastructure with which they live. So there's, they could be domestic terrorism. Significant domestic terrorism. And domestic terrorism, we saw some domestic terrorism in the 60s and 70s, but it wasn't very well organized. It wasn't very uh, sophisticated. It wasn't, didn't use weapons very cleverly. Imagine if you had the money, imagine some, I don't know, billionaire or rich guy who, who, who wants to fund a civil war or wants to fund a terrorist group or wants to fund purchase of military equipment and there's so much military equipment today all over the place. Police departments have military equipment. Federal agencies have milit military equipment. Individuals have military equipment in some states. I mean, just imagine what they could do, the havoc they can create. Now, we know that loners can, can create a lot of havoc, but usually loners die quickly and they're gone. What's really dangerous is organizations who can sustain of hundreds of people or thousands of people. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not as wide because partially I think that um, these organizations are monitored. I think it's hard to do this kind of stuff. Stealth, I think that all these militias and all these groups, the Timothy McVeighs of the world, as soon as they try to organize beyond one, two, five people, 
the FBI and other entities discover them and, and shut them down. But there are real possibilities, and, and you can see it right now with the kind of angst and the kind of hatred. I mean, what's going on today in America, I think, is unprecedented, certainly since the actual civil war, in terms of the hatred. I mean, people in red and blue states, some people in red and blue states, hate each other's guts. They really, really, really think that their fellow Americans are the enemy. And they are willing to cheat. They are willing to lie. And maybe the scariest to me is they're willing to follow. They're willing to accept tribalism. They're willing to accept the verdict of their tribe and do what the tribe tells them to do. And that's how you get into real civil wars. That's how you get into bloodshed. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, Subscribestar, Locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see The Iran Brooks Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.